Hey, welcome to a new episode of Podcast with Avash. For today's guest, we have Ned Menninger. He's an American and he recently published his documentary named The Potter Untold Story at Everest. So he went to Nepal around 2019 and uh, he went through experiencing a life of a potter himself. And he made a documentary about how their journey is and how their life goes by. So it's a really interesting um, conversation and something that hits us back home is how the life is going on for the people who struggle working as a potter or working as Sherpas in the mountaineering areas. So uh, if you're new to the channel, please do subscribe to our YouTube. Uh, Please do follow us on Facebook and uh, Instagram as well. Our website is www.podcastwith.com abhashavash.com so i really hope you subscribe and follow us and let's begin the podcast hey net kids hai hey kids are dai ah gal good kids are tumaro pura chatta par basya cha chiso chai kya hota tira chiso aligati chista ma maile ma america ma chu atlanta ma chu no atlanta ma na georgia Georgia, yeah. Atlanta, Georgia, Mata, Sahar Ho. So, I don't know. 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 I ইন্টারনেটবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্টবাটেন্ট
um, running with the bulls, Spain ma. Uh-huh. And so, oh, you Kylie, you ran with the bulls in Spain? Yeah. So Kylie running with the bulls got eco I I fell in love with the idea of immersion and doing things extreme. Oh, and dang, that's cool. Like that. And so it it just grew and grew and grew and grew and projects and projects and projects and I mero jindagi ma, you know, did a lick. In the game. I just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote because I thought that was my ticket to being a human, you know. Oh man, that's happen. amazing. And um, I thought, who would buy my books? No one reads nowadays. So, mm. and then who would believe them? Mm. Who would believe, you know? Go I mean, why would you believe me? There's no, there's no reason to believe crazy stories. Mm. So I wanted to prove it and to be, I wanted it to climb Everest for free. Mm. I wanted to show, you know, there's this very big gap between foreigners and mm-hmm. everyone in Nepal. It's just growing and growing and growing. And mm. it's really bad at Everest. And uh, I was like, maybe this can help. So there was a lot of different feelings going in, but definitely very selfish. I wanted to be famous and all these things. And then, no, go for it because that's your age. Up. You're uh, right about your age now. If you don't do it now, you're just going to be like regretting your whole life. And that's yeah, the time. Was, yeah. I mean, I, I wanted all that, but clearly it became something much more important. Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, let's go back to the Potter thing again. Uh, I want to get back to all your adventures. Uh, we have a ton of time to talk about, but the Potter thing, uh, it hit me such a, in a, such a way that when you decided, Bahia, right? yeah, the Potter, uh, like, uh, immersing yourself for the, travel road for I guess like 12 days it took 12 days 23 days for the whole thing and then oh. the actual expedition was just yeah 12 days 12 days so, so you got to get from Jiri to Lukla you know and then oh, from Lukla yeah, back to Saladi and yeah I, I've only heard my dad talk about it because he worked he used to work in the airport before when the mm-hmm. long time ago and I've never been there and he just says like that's a dangerous <laughs> airport <laughs> look like it's a dangerous airport and uh tra- a lot of people travel and just uh, give me a beginning when did you start to think about uh, before even you made the documentary uh mm-hmm. did you were you just planning to climb the everest as you said you wanted it to because it's, it's pretty expensive to travel for 60 70 thousand dollars but you yeah. just wanted to try find a, like an economical way to climb it as being uh maybe you can be a pl- potter to just climb it on free right that was the initial plan yeah i uh to go back i learned nepali mm-hmm. um so internet my lexique i learned because uh i wanted to swear to noble silence in a monastery and i thought that would be crazy and something to write about from america mm-hmm. it's very different to that thought mm-hmm. From Nepal, you see monks and things like that. We don't see monks here in America, mm-hmm. as you know. So I, to me, that would have been crazy to write about. So I taught myself Nepali. I went. Um, that's why I learned it. Because I had learned it, uh, I did one more project. And then I got a job guiding mm-hmm. students, foreign students, right? Vivesi in Nepal. Mm-hmm. And then uh, that's when I saw porters, how they live. Mm-hmm. I saw that they sleep in hard places i saw how strong they were and as an american athlete i wanted to see if i was as strong i wanted to see if i could handle it mm-hmm. and i thought it would be good to show this life because they're strong mm-hmm. and that's good to show um i wanted to climb everest for free because i had no money mm-hmm. and uh as an explorer you know everest is everest mm-hmm. so I wanted to do that and I knew I couldn't. And then uh, climbing as a porter would, would do everything. It would help the gap. It would get me to go for free. It would mm. it would show strong people and I'd be able to see if I could handle it, which I thought I could. Um, and then obviously it became, like we said, a lot more <laughs> than that. But yeah. that was why I left. That was how it started. Mm-hmm. Guiding the summer before and seeing it and having the idea and then Okay. Took off so there. did you were you in Nepal when you were planning or you when you were being becoming a guide and uh, yes yeah yeah so uh, you were just uh, you had no idea about like oh I wanted to climb Everest you just were thinking about oh you are you wanted to be guide and 
uh, be a normal tourist <laughs> in that sense. Well, well, I was guided. I never. I always wanted to do crazy, crazy projects. Mm. Like that's what I like to do. And guiding for me, it was with National Geographic, okay. a company related to them. So I guided just because I wanted to tell National Geographic what I do, mm -hmm. so they would give me a bigger job. Oh, know? that's all, man. And then, um, and then a bird just flew into my window. That's crazy. Oh, <laughs> um, but but uh, then I I um I wanted to I always wanted to do something big, and this was an opportunity to do something crazy. And so we thought of it, and I knew I could raise money for Everest because it's Everest and everyone knows that. And so we just, mm -hmm. just did it. I don't know. And then it became something different. You know, when we got there, I never raised the money I needed. I never raised $65,000 because that's impossible. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not impossible, but it's very hard. It's uh, 65,000 for someone to just climb Everest. And that's not, everybody's like climbing Everest and that's not, exactly. not much of a unique thing to do. And uh, it's d definitely raising fund for some kind of passion project is really, really hard. It is. And I thought, and even if I was going to climb as a porter, mm -hmm. that's still hard too. And, and uh, I wanted to raise the funds for the videographer to film it mm -hmm. because that was the whole point. I wouldn't do something so crazy without proof. Mm -hmm. So I got to Nepal and, and uh, I never raised the money. And I was there and I was like, what else can I do? I have very little money, um, but well, maybe we can go to base camp. And, mm -hmm. uh, and that ended up being so much more important because, you know, Everest is just 1,000 people every year. And in the Himalayas, 70,000 foreigners come to trek. Uh -huh. So 70,000 people just come to trek to Langtang or, or Annapurna or mm -hmm. wherever it may be. So Those are insanely beautiful. Like the... The s tourist spots are there, but the a vast amount of unexplored area is just insane. Huge, huge. So that's how it came about. This, this. Did you, did you, uh, once you started, think like, okay, uh, once you see, I saw an opportunity, Potter, uh, if you work as a Potter, you do the basic job of Potter, but you get to climb it for free and you get kind of paid. Uh, which is not much comparatively for as an American, it's not much money, but for people up there, it's life and their lively income. And uh, what did you think about it? How did you start to approach other people to get to get the job or yeah, to get to even get started, like to get that information? Yeah, the small world helped me a lot, which is a company there and not an NGO. Mm -hmm. So we set up a whole like team of people to climb Everest. So with that team. Mm -hmm. I was able to get a little money. And then with that money, I bought a ticket to Nepal. Okay. And then obviously I never raised the money. So that wasn't possible. Um, and I didn't really have a, a team to work with. So, cause it was a different project and so many other things. So it was like, I know I just walked into Tamel and just asked 20 places to, to if I could do this. Man, you just walked in and I was like, are you hiring? <laughs> yeah, I was like, I need, this is the idea, you know, we want to make a film. And I said we, but it's just me. I didn't even, mm -hmm. Babin Dulal, um, who had shot the film. Babin Dulal, yeah. He, uh, I don't, I don't know if I'd met him before or after. I only met him like a few days before this started. Because <laughs> So you had like, no idea if he could even do it or not? I had no idea who would film the movie at that point. I was like, the person who was supposed to film it couldn't. And uh, so I was in Nepal with n no job and no one to film it. And yet I had already spent people's money. Yeah. So I was like, oh no, this is bad. You got, you so got, to, you got to do something to, yeah, to so, have a, a authentication of what you wanted to do. Exactly. So I kept training. I kept training for Everest. And I had a friend teach, who had summited teach me all the rope climbing. Mm -hmm. And I was filming it. I hired someone to film it because I figured if I filmed it, maybe the money would come. Maybe if I just kept training for it, the money would come. And uh, she brought an assistant and that assistant was Babin. Babin was like, I have some time. I was like, I don't have a lot of money, but this is a big idea, trust me. I didn't even really know, yeah. you know? And he said, okay. And then I went to Tamel and asked companies and one, actually only one. And it was the first one I walked into. What What did the others say who didn't want it? Like they didn't want to show the life of the potter or the journey? Or what was the reasoning? 
I mean, yeah, I knew this question would come up. There's a lot of, you know, it's there's a lot of reasons, and they have mm-hmm. good reasons. Mm-hmm. They have very good reasons. Um, you know, I I wasn't Nepali. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm I didn't have a typical the working you know mm-hmm. things you're supposed to have. Um, so it was a different situation, and it would have required being open and doing a lot of things and taking a risk, a little bit of a risk because you don't know what I'm going to make. I might not make anything and one company agrees. So I, I don't, the other people, as they said, I think what anyone would say, and maybe there wasn't companies to work for. There might not have been tracks, you know, there, it was March. Yeah. Uh, it was so a time right around the Corona craziness started, right? Oh no, one year before. Oh wait, wait. Oh my god, I'm I'm missing that thing. I forgot. 2019. <laughs> See the like 2020, I'm like uh, I, the whole year skipped, man. <laughs> yeah. But one said yes and then that was it. Yeah. And we had everything in place. So, uh when you start uh, when they said yes and uh, did you have a uh, lodging and other places like uh, okay, did they plan out for you you'll be staying here, you'll be earning this much or at, like it's all up to you? Yeah, well, so we we um, they said you know we can you can work with this this group of five people mm-hmm. from where Denmark and uh, I think Australia and okay you start in Lukla on this date and uh, okay how much money will you make this is how much money you will make how much money will you spend you know the numbers were never that accurate because well people just didn't really know I think or or I don't know how public it is so. Yeah, I I almost well I think they I have no idea about that business but everybody starts to haggle a little bit and try to bring down the cost and uh especially for you it's like they don't know if you can carry it the whole way <laughs> they might think like okay we need insurance policy just uh, just to be sure maybe others can help out but I mean uh, they they were nice to even let you uh, go around the journey. Oh yeah, so nice. And the other porters had to do do a lot extra you know because i didn't at first i didn't know how to tie my bag i didn't know how to where i was going slowly at my neck hurt i didn't were they were they mad at you or no they weren't mad because i i was just trying really hard so i think that helped if i maybe if i wasn't trying as hard they would have been mad and they should have been mad they still should have been mad because I required a lot of help and I didn't know things and I asked the same questions a lot and uh so it, the- you went there with the people I I don't know how many of them spoke English because uh, most of the potter probably knew few words and they do speak with the tourists but I don't know how well they spoke but uh, did you have any trouble speaking from the amount you learned in the police amount of uh, uh, vocabulary you went with them did you have a hard time communicating um no i think it's just just basic basic Basically. vocabulary you know i'm i'm i can speak about basic things mm-hmm. and in the film it looks like i have i can speak really well but we're not saying you know nasa's planetary movement moves in this orbital you know we're not saying that stuff i don't know those words and i say nasa because you're sure i don't know <laughs> i'm like but, found, found this okay. cool shirt in I forgot where, like uh, cheap place. I'm like, oh, this is cool, NASA. Yeah. And who should I have guest uh, with? I, uh, I try to find some new shirt every time with the guest, and I'm like, this doesn't match well. But what? What the hell? <laughs> oh, it cool. does. I love it. My my, com- I made a company because you have to make a company for, yeah. and I call it Pathfinder. If you know Pathfinder, it's the Mars rover. Oh, went- oh, oh, yeah, the satellite, right? No, no. It's, a, it's a rover. It's like a little robot. And oh, like, on the, uh, the did it just uh, was it no. decommissioned? I don't think so, right? Oh, it's, maybe it was a hundred years. No, it was like oh, it was like a long time ago. It was like probably sixty years ago. Yeah, that's a really old robot. Yeah. <laughs> I heard like so, it sings its own happy birthday every year. Exactly, <laughs> I love it because it's the first one. I just I love the idea mm-hmm. of it. So and it's in space and so you so you you got that explorer. Uh, personality I hope so I want to <laughs> and uh, what about like uh, once you started talking with them how did they how was the communication because I always feel like because they are there to do their job and they're trying to fix the potter 
they're trying to yeah. figure out a lot of a lot of things are on what you call stake for yeah. them it's like uh, they need to complete their job they can't mess around they need to be reasonable with their cost and everything so when right. they have you as uh, someone who is going to be there for a little bit and mm. uh, taking their time and uh, taking a little bit uh, i guess the teammate but there is like a newbie uh, whenever there's a new person in the team yeah, it's, it's like, like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know you know exactly it that's it it's 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 you you don't want to speak too much because you know that they have a job to do mm-hmm. you know and you're just doing it one time and you're doing your own thing and you don't want to you know they have a job and that job is already hard and mm. a lot of jobs are hard but that job is already a job it already requires a lot of work and you don't want to make that add extra mm. you know when you don't have to so i tried to stay as quiet as i could i still talk a bit but uh you know when there's time to talk there's a lot of time to talk when you're done mm. you know when you put your bag down when you're asking advice uh but when you got to work you got to work mm. and so you don't want to be like help me help me you know you got to you got to go because they're doing their own job yeah did you ever feel like how do you, how did the cameraman i was also thinking is like oh, people should just watch his documentary i love it it's in vimeo and it's on, yeah. under the name the potter untold story of the everest so just watch it for everybody i know i'm just like uh, i was really imp- uh, impressed with the simplicity and very simple simple and fun of it right now uh there's not many many movie coming out this is really good <laughs> i'm just uh, yeah letting... i mean it's, it's off i don't know if simple but well simple can be complicated i yeah. don't know it's a, it's a simple uh storytelling i guess uh, from your side authentic. of experience authentic authentic yeah. but it's it's it gives it goes in depth and it goes in detail about their livelihood and their life basically of that journey do you uh as you said uh, oh wait i was going for like the cameraman okay was he with you the whole time or did he sleep in the same place or what was the arrangement um the camera yeah just does i don't know well, i was caught up on the simplicity thing of it because i don't i don't know if simple is a good word because it's it means like yeah some not, not as simple but it's simple it's a less. yeah simple is less. i think it's just authentic authentic yeah authentic is more honest and just straightforward Straight like forward. anyways the cameraman stayed with me uh the cameraman is very important mm-hmm. you know it was just it was just babin and i that was it you know so i had not been a cameraman i haven't been to camera school film school i'd never researched or read any books i knew nothing man you dipped me. your toe way <laughs> This is like, oh, I'm going to Nepal in the other side of the world. I don't know much about camera, but I'm going to be going to uh well, that's a really I'm going to carry a ton of load and I'm going to climb to the Everest. Man, you where did you get your guts from? I need some. <laughs> I think it's stupidity. I think it is stupidity. It's Maybe a not. it's a I guess you'll remember it forever. That's a interesting sense of like even having that stupidity is the best thing you could do it's like you exactly. i'm trying to i'm trying to relearn that stupid <laughs> become naive again but i don't so he was the most important and mm-hmm. i didn't know him so i didn't know his talent mm-hmm. you know and i had never shot a movie so i didn't know if i were to, supposed to direct how i was supposed to direct at the same time i want to be a part of this mm-hmm. project i I need to be immersed. Any time I come out, any time I act like an American, any time I act like I'm a camera director person, mm-hmm. I'm ruining I'm ruining the film. I'm ruining the immersion because I'm I'm being disrespectful to them, I felt. Mm-hmm. Because if they're going to bring me in, I need to give them 100% of my attention. Mm-hmm. But you also have a film. And so I wanted him Babin. Mm-hmm. I wanted to give him everything. he needed to be more than comfortable so stay in the hotel if you need to do this do that here's extra money for you know mm. any money i could give i just wanted to be like you need this is everything on you and make him feel okay you you should be committed for this project right. as much as you can 
as much as I can. Yeah, I'm not. I, I didn't give him much money. I didn't have much, but I made sure he was. I wanted to make sure he was as comfortable as possible. But he still, he had to stay up. I don't think, in truth, he ever told me how much how hard he really worked because, you know, you have to stay up really late to load the footage, the camera footage into the computer. Mm. And when it's very cold at Everest, the batteries freeze and they go out and you have to solar charge them. We had one little solar charger that I bought and, <laughs> you know, there's just a lot of work of SD cards and loading things into laptops mm. and staying up late and, ha- and, I'm, and I'm yelling at him being like, you need to be at 7 a.m. when we wake up. I need you there before we wake up. I need you to capture it. And, you know, that's just, and that's so that's work uh, of uh, being a technical like in a cinematography. I I do cinematography and I would do short films. I was like, okay, director, we need this, and that's a part of th- that comes with a job. As him, he's probably n- I would not say I don't know about him, but uh, as you said, you don't know about his work skills as well. So you were bl- going as blind uh, blindly, trusting him, which turned out really good. Uh, I would. Uh, I'd say he did pretty good job. The, all the interviews were great. I don't know how, how you set up the interviews and who edited it later, but the whole package itself turned out to be, as you said, in your own words, authentic and clean. And all the B-rolls were great, and all the cinematic, and everything was super great. He did the. Uh, he, he filmed so he filmed you know ninety whatever percent. Mm-hmm. When he couldn't film, there were certain times I filmed, mm-hmm. but. If you're smart, you can tell when I'm filming. And then there is even one time, you know, a porter, another porter uh, was filming. And that was actually, I think, the most authentic part of the entire film was that the high camp in Kalapatars. If you do watch the film, we are singing and we are all mm-hmm. very happy for a moment. And that is, there's no cameraman, which means no one, no one's lo- thinking of the camera and whoever's holding the camera is a porter. So it's, yeah, you had a lot of cell phone footage as well. I had some cell phone footage yeah. or GoPro too for my okay. phone. And uh, yeah, it was the the editing and all of that. You know, you do your own stuff for your mm-hmm. podcast. I didn't know film, as I mentioned, but I came home and I didn't have the money or help to do it um, the way I wanted to. So I just, I learned, I learned it all. And I had my dad's, my dad's editing system. Mm-hmm. So... I learned editing, I learned coloring, I learned audio correction, and I spent, you know, almost a year, o- over six months in a room by myself. Just you did great, man. Just it's it's, it's to- paying off. I hope it's paying off for you. Yeah, it is. The interviews too were cool. Babin set up the interviews with the light, but not the light, but like the cameras, and uh-huh. I didn't know what I was doing because I'd never done interviews. So I was like, I'd ask a question or two about the portering, and then just try to talk and see what their experience was like in the mountains, I guess. I don't, I don't. Oh, they, they were going straight. Like they, it, it was clean, authentic. They, I didn't think anybody felt like they were acting or feeling scared of the cameras. It mm-hmm. was, it came out pretty well. Uh, uh, that's what Did I thought is just, I did not knew like how much of a camera proficiency you had. Uh, just uh, looking at the cam, uh, the documentary, it felt a little roughy as when, as you said, uh, you could tell like somebody is not proficient with like making it uh, film quality, but for documentary, it, it's just perfect. But uh, yeah. let's get back I to. Think, I still uh, think it's film quality, but oh, it it is film quality, but type. yeah, I think it's a type. Yeah, it's it's it w- works really well with all the cuts, I guess. Uh, but how how did you, uh, as you said, like uh, when you go technical? him uh your uh, cameraman bobby in recording all of those things how did uh how did like how did your management go did you were you able to just like sh- tell him like okay you need to be there as you said or did you go with okay we need to have all the 14 days you need to be by me go ahead with it yeah it's a, that's i wish babin was here with us <laughs> <laughs> because he's like yeah, he's lying he, he, <laughs> he kicked yeah, he's like the worst person to work with that's the problem <laughs> I think you would say that I think you know in America we have I don't know biz, business is different in every country yeah and uh, it's very 
cutthroat in America, I think. Mm-hmm. Not that it's not in Nepal. There's just different business. So mm-hmm. sometimes I'd be too aggressive, like, you need to be on time. Or you need to be. And then he'd be like, then he'd come back and be like, well, then you need to do this and you need to do that. And I'd be like, I'm not giving you money for that. He'd be like, fine, then I'm going to charge for this because I already gave you this for free. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Let's, let's <laughs> you do you, I'll do me. And I found whenever I got, you know, since I didn't know much about it, I tried to do, I tried to do things that were, if, if I took too far of a step out of my role, mm-hmm. he would step back at me. And then I'd be like, oh, this is going to hurt the product. I need to give him more power. And there's a few times just perspectives, you know, as an American, I know that like, I need to capture the American smiling at base camp and the foreigner smiling at base camp because that, that is like, as an American, you can see the difference because mm-hmm. I know both sides, but for Babin who's from Nepal, it's, he might not think of that, but he also would think of other things that I don't think about. So I think next time, if there were ever to be next time, I, Babin would just take it. I just let Babin direct everything and let me go in. And he was, the more, the longer we got, the more or better our relationship got. And then, and the less intrusive, like, it was just you do you and I'll do me and, <laughs> and that was it. And yeah, we, I guess for you as an, an going into a new category of, okay, I'm doing a documentary first time, getting that relationship while also doing your job as a potter is, okay, too, you, you, were, you were going double job. job. It was very, very mentally difficult. <laughs> mentally oh yeah, difficult. tell me about the potter's thing itself. My God, that, the load, it... Uh, the carriers, like how much, how much of average weight do they usually carry? The porters, so there are two porters. There are the porters for foreigners, mm-hmm. um, not for foreigners, for visitors, for trekkers. And uh, they are allowed to carry 25 kilos maximum. Mm-hmm. That is what they're supposed to carry. Sometimes they carry more, mm-hmm. 30, 40, but that's on them and for extra stuff. And, uh, or... You know, it's not super regulated. Mm-hmm. And then there are local porters, which carry all the goods to hotels and restaurants and everything. And they can carry, they don't work for companies like that. So they can mm-hmm. carry a hundred kilos. They can carry more than a hundred kilos. And so my challenge was, if I can't climb Everest, which was my goal, what, what can be my Everest then? Like what will be the Everest of this project? And I was like, well, a hundred kilos. That's the craziest amount of weight. Can I do that? Yeah, you, you carried know? the whole thing at the end of the doc, uh, almost at the end of the pro- uh, the documentary. I saw you, mm-hmm. and you just as soon as you dropped that uh, carriage in the destination, and <laughs> I saw you wobble for a little bit. I was done. I was dead. That that's five years of work for me to get there to all these projects. How much, how much distance did it cover with a hundred kz? That was only like seven point, probably seven point seven kilometers. I, I started. Oh, that that's a lot. That's a lot. It's not. It, real porters carry that two to three hours faster than I did. Like, Holy cow! I was slow. I was like stopping so much. They don't. You can't show that in the film because it would take too long. But it took me a long, long time to go not that far. So you started your journey in uh, Lukla. Jiri. I started in Jiri. Jiri. So you got your stuff and they handed you, okay, these are the guests' luggage. So you need to be from point A to point B within how many days? So first, yeah, so I, from Jiri to Lukla, I walked just with Babin because that was the cheap way to go. You know, you can fly to Lukla, mm-hmm. but I wanted to do it like a porter mm-hmm. and they come from valleys. So I was like, I'm going to walk. And that was when you switch the diet, when I start eating salt tea, you know, Sherpa tea and oh. it was very different from American diet. It's mm. the opposite. You know, it's it's we have sugar, they have salt. Salt, right? I've never tasted that, but I have heard of it. But it's oh. really healthy, I, I guess. I don't know. I, I don't yeah, like that, it. I, okay. I would not I can't imagine salt tea. <laughs> I like sugar. I love sugar. <laughs> and it was very different. My body had to change. So by eight days we started in Lukla. Luckily everything came together and uh then we meet the clients and then we just always have to leave. We always have to arrive before the clients at the destination mm-hmm. and we are just catering to them. So 
they have a schedule to reach these places, but if one gets sick, you have to turn around. If they want to wait an extra day, you wait an extra day. You know, you do whatever your clients want. That's... And then you get to the you get to base camp and you put the bags down and you have to go to base camp without bags hmm. to be insurance for clients. So if they get sick, porters have to carry them out. And uh that's when you go to base camp. And then the last twelfth day your job is over on the 11th when you finally get back to Lukla. And on the 12th morning, you wake up at 6 a.m. and you're not getting paid. You've already gotten tipped. So your job is over. But you still wake up at 6 and you go to the airport and you take their bags and you get their bags on the airplane. And, you know, you have to work that morning and there's no money for it. <sighs> the or whole, there was no for us. Yeah, it almost feels like there's an ecosystem of... Uh, uh, because it's been running the whole tourism sector in that area has been running for many many years they have mm-hmm. kind of developed an ecosystem of uh, what works and when to get pay, uh, like how much of an effort you would want to give how much for the tourist or guest as you say we treat uh, in Nepal people to uh, tourist as a guest because it's a big source of income and it's uh, regarded as a good hospitality as well and uh, they have i can i think they kind of made into okay couple this many days up there and try to uh of course try to get some more money but uh they'll try to see i uh, give as much service as they can but uh try not to be too i guess they try not to be too ripped off as well and some kind of uh, i i don't know, like compare comparing it to american uh, way of uh, we work is not i would not even say it's uh, close because uh, in American system it's really you have to be uh, everybody have to be paid for their work and it's really how to say equality based up there it's like okay try to do as much as you can you the hospital hospitality is up there but I would say it's uh, not as the same as like you try to give more as much as you can but try to take as much more as you can too from both sides the tourist uh, comes from different backgrounds and cultures, as you might have experienced. Not everybody's like American. There's uh, European and a lot of uh, other countries they come from, and they have their own uh, culture and hospi- hospitality. And the tipping system is different in every place. So the tour, I guess that uh, <laughs> the potters knows like, okay, the, some places tip more, some don't. You have to kind of be lucky. If you're lucky, uh, you might make make more, or some. If you're unlucky, the gear can kind of get get messed up. Yeah, th- it's an honor to talk to you because you you understand. You know, a lot. It's talking to a lot of people in America don't understand these these things. But I mean, not at first, mm-hmm. and not until you tell them. But you get it. Yeah. The there's a couple reasons. Tips. People are coming from China and Japan. Like it's not customary mm-hmm. to tip, so they're not going to tip maybe as much. And that's not their fault. It's just not their culture. Mm-hmm. And then two is everything in the film, every porter house, every porter home is segregated, which means, you know, just completely separated. You can't see it. If you are a client and you are trekking Everest and you, you will never see where your porters sleep and you won't even know. Yeah. So come time for tipping, you don't even know what they're doing. So why would you tip a lot? And then the third issue, the third one is also, you know, there are different prices for foreigners Mm -hmm. and for locals. And that uh, as a foreigner, it just, you know, it it affects you. Yeah. And I remember because when I was a little kid and we went to a local zoo and there's a price for Nepali, Nepali and a few other neighboring countries is one price, I guess. But uh, for foreigners, and there's like completely how many times more multiple uh, multiple times more prices and they say well in uh, in america we don't charge that way <laughs> that's oh. like full full discrimination but up there is more like tourist local and uh it's a whole economy is based on tourism and uh, local people are trying to treat tourists as as good as they can so they almost feel like ours and theirs and yes. th- yeah. Oh, yeah and it doesn't mean bad it just means a system is de- developed in that sense so tr- uh, for them charging extra for a tourist uh, to see local heritage is like n- not bad at all 
a lot of time, the transportation and other things, if you go in the public uh, space, the charge is going to be same as the local. But if you s go to see heritage or natural architecture or any specific tourist place, it, there you're going to be charged more. But yeah. in Nepal, it's, uh, the, it's comparatively w way cheaper than uh, what you'd expect. So tourists don't mind it as well. Yeah, I think that's, that's, you know, that's a cool thing to say that they're, it's not better or worse. It's just different in the system. Mm. The thing is, is it does, I don't know what creates it, but, you know, there was all these articles last year about the trash on Everest. Mm. And is it their trash or our trash, the foreigners trash, or is it local? There's this separation mm -hmm. between the two and it, it's just a divide. Yeah, it's, it's. Gro Not it good. grows because I would not say I don't I have no idea about I'm just I'm just talking here. I've never been yeah. to I've never even seen snow in Nepal. <laughs> so I'm like completely guessing. But it's always the government the 60, uh, 60 70 thousand that you pay to uh, climb the Everest doesn't go exactly to them. It goes to the government. That's the government's charge. And when the government takes the money, and there's, of course, as, as a third world country, there's a lot of corruption and there's a lot of mismanagement of funds. And uh, you just see like, oh, I paid so much money as a tourist. And uh, right. for the locals, it's just like, I don't know how much you paid. We're, we're just dealing in the local base. So restaurant, I charge you this much, that much. And you leave your trash there. You d they don't see the uh, amount you paid as a t tourist. You paid 65000 That doesn't mean you... you you uh, gives you allow you to trash more but uh, you also have to think about as a tourist it's hard you paid so much money and you're like you don't find a proper way to uh, dispose stuff so there's no option for you too so no. the, yeah those are two way of thinking i don't think they have managed well enough for them to be like the uh, see the tourist to be able to say even the trashing of the everest yeah. I don't think there's like much trash bins there <laughs> to begin yeah. with. Yeah, this is the, well, this is the thing. It's a gift. I mean, Everest is Everest. Mm -hmm. So it's the front of so many issues in the world because it's the tallest mountain. So it's going to represent the entire trekking industry. And not only that, um, a lot of the trends of the world, which are like markets coming together, mm -hmm. nations coming together to share. And so, you want the corruption you 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 know you want you talk about the corruption mm. you're from nepal mm -hmm. i i can't talk about the corruption because i'm not from nepal yeah, i and don't know if you see by your own eyes then you can say it and right now it's just like even i'm guessing because i don't know we, right, we just at, as nepali we just like to say we know there's corruption we can't point it out exactly even if we point it out it's just like you can say everybody hates their uh, everybody hates uh, corruption but everybody knows it's there and they can't do it they feel powerless and it's more uh, up a little bit more open up there but there's yeah. like a whole system that you just like oh my god i don't want to see it Let's, let there it is, be. yeah there's two si my thing is there's two systems now because mm -hmm. the one system is internal mm -hmm. in nepal and the other system is external everyone coming to nepal mm -hmm. and that's there are the there are the foreigners who pay sixty five thousand mm -hmm. to climb Everest. There are the foreigners who pay two three grand to go to Everest Base Camp, mm -hmm. you know, and they have a good company. And but then there are the foreigners like, you know, I was one of these. I I was one of these um, who don't pay enough. There's a mountain called Imjatse, which is called Islands Peak, mm -hmm. uh, and if you look up, it's like five thousand something dollars three hundred with a company. Mm -hmm. I had climbed that before all of this for five hundred dollars, <laughs> so it's it's like in America you're praised for traveling and haggling, you're praised for bargaining, you're praised for getting low prices. But this this is the problem. This is what I want to share is that that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Is when you pay such a low price, you think you're being a good traveler. You think you're being strong and getting the low price and you your parents are gonna be proud your friends are gonna be proud but when you undercut the market mm -hmm. you know people have to let you come i mean there's so many companies in nepal that if you don't have business and someone comes in with a low a low uh bid and you can't you don't you don't you can't pay your bills like you're going to say yes 
Mm-hmm. And it's that foreigner's fault for for making that price for asking to do this Everest spacecraft for, you know, five hundred dollars or a hundred dollars, mm-hmm. and they'll do it, and then their porters are going to suffer. And that's as a foreigner, because that's all I can speak to. That's our fault, right? Mm-hmm. Because your vote, however you act, is your vote in the system, mm-hmm. and it's it's true. It's both ways. I think both the the solution. If you watch the film, I don't, I came into a lot of information. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't mean to do this and I know a lot of information now. Mm-hmm. And I could have said some, I could have said things in certain ways mm-hmm. in the film, right? You can say things in certain ways and point fingers at this mm-hmm. person or that person. But I didn't think that that would be sustainable solution mm-hmm. because it doesn't matter who did wrong. It's more like, okay, well, how are we going to fix this? And the only way is going to be together. That's the only way to actually make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm trying to transition to and trying to stay away from saying it. I almost feel like you, once you you decided and once you started the journey, a lot of the information kind of felt a little bit of transformative for yourself as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it changed me. It, It changed me. Mm. It was very, very hard for me. The movie for me was, it's very hard for everyone. I just said on a podcast mm. yesterday, everyone has their struggles. But for me, this was, this was very difficult. And the movie has been, you know, the, the word cathartic. It, the movie mm. is like, I was working through my own things. Like the farther I get through the movie, the better I can become myself, mm. the better I can handle my own issues. So I did it, uh, you know, it's helped me more than it's helped other people. It's By this um, time, when you were uh, traveling uh, as a taken as a, during that job, have you, how much time had you spent time in Nepal? I had been, before it started, I'd been there six months over like a nine month period, mm-hmm. maybe five to six months. And, um, and then this project, after this, it was, you know, I'd been there nine months in 15 months in my life. Okay. So. I mean, that's a good reasonable amount to know the culture, know the people, and you spoke Nepali too, and it kind of helped you out. So as as an American, what did you find was the most shocking or most transformative like information you received? as like, this is completely out of my uh, peripheral of having lived in America. Was mm-hmm. it any places or things that happened? This is so interesting. You know, so when you're an American, you were you born in Nepal? Yeah. Right. So a little different for me. When you're an American, you're brought up with, let's say even if you're poor, and you can be very, very poor in America. You can you can have a worse life than in Nepal in America. Mm-hmm. Huh? But there's access to a lot of things here, mm-hmm. right? And even if you're poor everyone in the world has it's i think it's changing now but has thought that america is the holy grail you know and this is the place you got to go this has the best everything the best the best the best the best and as an american you believe that you are the center of the world you know (laughs) and going to nepal it was not nepal it could have been anywhere it could have been anywhere and living someone else's trying to live someone else's life you know if if you are to follow your brother if you are to follow your mother or Mm -hmm. sister or a friend brush your teeth at the same time you know run the same distance study the same books eat the same food if you were to do everything that he did as best as you could for 23 days even just for one day (laughs) right yeah let's say you do it for 23 days i came back and i had like a scar of emotion Hmm. and that scar this is wild but that scar at first felt like i didn't know the difference at that point i didn't know the difference between that scar and me Hmm. i had gone so deep just to make a good movie that i had like lost myself completely in someone else's reality right Hmm. and eventually that scar the, the reason i think i could cut the film without any experience was because i let that scar like just do it for me i let that that emotion was just like okay this will make the decisions and as i got through it i learned to realize like 
this scar is different from is different from what I experience. And in that you realize like, oh, I like this scar is not even as much as a true porter feels because I'm not a true porter and I never will be. But it's different from mine. And I it's different and it's not really mine. And then you start to realize that there are just so many emotions or perspectives that you will never know truly and you just recognize that you have a whole background that i just i don't know i do, all i know is what i know you know is what came from me and that was the realization was like you don't you don't know what you don't know like there could be feelings that you don't know exist there could be in america we have this big black lives matter movement and there's a lot of angst on both sides and i think People just don't know. You know, you just don't know why they're angry. Why are this person or that person angry? You don't know, and and it's hard to understand why, because you you don't have the same background, so you can't really it's, wrap your head around it. Yeah, it's not. A, it doesn't. It's hard to get grasp it in the few words or if somebody explains it or unless you live it, go through it, the experiences are not going to be the same and it's hard to understand it. Exactly. And, and the experience as it might have been for you, as you said, it uh, looks like it pretty much have been a little transformative for yourself as a growing as a person too. Yeah, I think I, getting through it, you know, you learn because I was trying to be famous, you know, so everything revolved around me and i still want it to but <laughs> i mean yeah. there's I, there's real problems you know i didn't want to do any social justice or issue movie i wanted to do strong on everest and become a formula one driver and mm -hmm. you know just crazy fun stuff and then all of a sudden you walk into a real problem on this earth mm -hmm. like a, a place where people are probably not getting paid what they deserve any people, it doesn't matter Nepal or, or American or, you know, mm -hmm. South African people are probably not getting what they deserve. Mm -hmm. And then you walk into it and it's like, yeah. oh my God. And that, that was, I think the whole concept, what you went through was the first uh, thing I, uh, was the first thing came into my mind when I saw the CNN article is like, okay, what was going is through his mind? Did he want, did he knew before he tried it or did he, did he just try it and get to know what the experience is? Because I, as soon as I heard the article, as I saw the article, it's just like American boy, uh, American, a guy. Uh, yeah, I wonder what you think. I'm very curious to hear your perspective because you're, you're Nepali. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been in the States for 12 years now. So <laughs> not much of a perspective, but uh, as a memory of how things, uh, I have a different perspective now, but uh, I guess uh, for me as middle ground, uh, having an American lifestyle and trying to see, remembering back in Nepal, the same thing, the moment hit is like, okay, you're gonna, this guy sh saw like a hard life. A hard life in America, uh, there's of course really hard life here too, but it's not the same kind of hard life as living in a third world country. A third world country's hard life is an uh, insane hard life that you think is having two meals a day is a luxury. To having two meals a day is a luxury. Having chicken, chicken uh, meat is a luxury. Uh, Poor people in America can afford a car to, I'm not saying everybody, but you can say you are still under poverty and still drive a car. And that's completely out of thing. Like you don't think people in Nepal, whoever drives a car are put as, as like really rich people. And that's, yeah. uh, the, uh, I guess that's how the, the poverty level is really poor, poor uh, how do you say, insanely down. And the things might be looking good, things might be looking bad with the crisis happening now. But uh, the potters who work there, they have, as, uh, as you indicated in the video uh, or the documentary, where a lot of them were farmers beside doing the pottery after the time. And the f life of a farming is also insanely hard. It's, it's not like farming and go to market. They have insanely hard lifestyle and the farming is really in the in, it's almost like works not like a modern sense of farming it's more ancient way of farming 
and when you do potter uh when you do the potter work which is like extra bonus work for them is like having to way to earn some tips and way to earn some living extra cash but the work itself is such insanely hard that you have to carry such a big load for treacherous journey you might sprinkle your ankle you must uh, the body deteriorates and the the whole passes of trying to make ends meet and trying to provide for the family and seeing you try to do that um uh, i i almost felt like okay you i don't know how much uh, story you had b- while going in i know you came out with a lot of story so as soon as i s- saw the article i'm like i want to catch that story and that's what i wanted to talk to you is like what was that transform transformative feel <laughs> because i knew it yeah. it would hit you yeah i was also i also am my family's pretty well off in america mm-hmm. so like i'm not just coming from america i'm coming from some wealth in america mm-hmm. you know not the richest family but i had all i needed you had a, you, had a, a, you could afford a good life in america yeah yeah i i mean i can't but my parents can mm-hmm. and and uh you know i think i think poverty in america feels like poverty in nepal mm-hmm. it feels the same mm-hmm. you might have more you might have a car mm-hmm. but it feels this it's the same feeling feelings are th- definitely going to be same i mean i don't really know but i think it's the same it's very hard in both places yeah Not yeah, yeah you you know what it almost feels like a, uh, you know the relative theory not i'm not say theory but relativity is like yeah exactly if you even even if you have a car the sadness and the pain you feel is not going to be uh more than the or less than the people who is living in africa the sadness and the pain is still going to be the same of the thing okay. you lo- lose or things you lost but the quality of life might be a little bit uh, better in america con- compared to third world country yeah, but uh, the yeah. pain and hardship is still Amer- in america is going to be the same as any other people yeah. and and you know we are the land of extremes so if you're very very poor here it might be worse mm-hmm. i mean being maybe not but there are bad things mm-hmm. here too anyways i would say the one thing i did retain is not worse or better it's just different yeah, it but the uh you know in walking into this and coming back to america because of where i'm from and my background i have a special position to be able to share this story mm-hmm. you know i went to a college where i can connect with people who work with cnn so i can mm-hmm. get the cnn if i'm lucky if i build a project and platform i can mm-hmm. do it because i have the connections and i can get even further but um i think you can go too far you know why i realized a lot that there that there are different emotions and different feelings mm-hmm. and there really are that i don't currently feel as part of my life i recognize there are other emotions for other lives um i do not want to overstep my boundary you know i think that it's very easy to say i want to fight for porters i want to help their situation mm-hmm. I, you know and i think i think that's bad i think that's not sustainable to say and come in and want to change someone else's reality mm-hmm. even if you think it's better because a i'm not a porter mm-hmm. right i don't actually know what's the best mm-hmm. for them i i know what a good system is based off of what i've learned and things and i have better ideas but they know what's truly better mm-hmm. hopefully i hope and then the second one is i think i, I don't know i mean i don't want to get to whatever about no, it no just I, just express what you that's that's what i wanted to talk about is you got yeah, you I, you were exposed to something that's really rare, rarity you know for a lot of people is uh, a lot of people go for extreme adventure uh, and uh, you went there initially to with that uh, intent as well you wanted to ad- experience life but you came out with uh, a, a little transformative so you are a lit- you definitely feel a more mature person <laughs> than when I'm, you when you came out right i think so yeah <laughs> yeah and that that's the thing is like we want our audience to f- uh, know and maybe experience that someday in themselves as well yeah, well I would say you know the reason I traveled mm-hmm. is not to like fix this or that it's to show mm-hmm. people and the reason I originally did this was to just 
to just make a movie, you know, when you're in Nepal and when you're in a place that doesn't have as much media attention like Nepal or Guatemala or a place mm-hmm. like this, you might start believing the hype just like Americans believe the hype, that America is the best place, that you can only be the best in America, that it's such a great place. And part of me in making this film, and this is even before the film, I can just probably articulate it now better, is that, hopefully, is that hmm. I wanted to make, to be like, look, you know, like you make a movie about how strong, they're, let's say there was no issue and you're still showing how strong Porter work are, right? Hmm. America, whoever's doing it. Mm-hmm. It's like, look at how everyone thinks about a porter. You, you think that these guys are unbelievably strong. And I want to be like, you're strong. It doesn't matter where you come from. The goal is not America. The goal is not have foreigners help. I think the goal is to show that you have something yourself. And I mean, this is when you get really cliche and cheesy, but you know, this is why it's uncomfortable for me to say you're fighting for them because I'm fighting for what I experienced Mm -hmm. and that was an issue. And I just, I have to share that because I experienced that issue, Mm -hmm. but, but I also want people to fight for themselves. Like that's the most sustainable form of humanity is when everyone can fight for themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Like that, that's that's the goal of human life. Yeah. You even you making us this small documentary and you being able to explore it and tell your stories that kind of brings up in light of their lives and that's been hidden amongst even even in nepali like we know there's hard struggle for potter even yeah. in lukla or even in mountains or even regular Kathmandu valley there's a lot of potters the life we just know that pain but it's more like a curtain you yeah. we try to avoid it because you kind of like you kind of get numb seeing all the pain because in america you see a poor dog walking in the street i'm like oh my god the dog is lost you feel you feel like, oh, so sad. You want to try to help it out. I, I did that before, right? But when you see uh, sad uh, in Nepal, like uh, poor people and uh, beggars and other, like a lot of people going through a lot of challenges all the time, every day, you get, your sensitivity gets numbed as well. Wait, this is, this is what I completely agree because that was not my intention. My intention was not to show sad. It was to show power and to show pride. And to be like, you can look at the stray dog and think sad, or you can look at that dog and think, wow, that dog's on his own and he's so he's still alive and he's getting his own food and that's awesome. You know, you can flip your mind. Mm. And that was my goal to be like, what if we look at places that we think are dangerous, that we think are bad or this, and we see the other sides of them. Mm. You know, when I travel to Nepal, um, and th- this is the whole reason I really got into this, and I've never really articulated it, but this is like, when you go to Nepal, mm. when you go to another country, coming from America, our economy is very good. Our business is very developed, mm-hmm. right? But if you're gonna travel, and you're gonna think that America is the best, you're not gonna learn anything. Mm-hmm. Because America is not the best, right? It's mm-hmm. the best, maybe the best economy, but best businesses, practices, but Nepali, like African, Asian, South America have been on the earth just as long, if not longer. Mm-hmm. And then they have to have had developed in different ways. If not their economy, perhaps something else. So when I go to a country, I try to see like, oh, what is it that this country is more developed than Americans in? And if you've lived in America, you know that our family values are terrible. Like our, our capacity for love is not great. We, you know, we're very, we're uh, very yeah. Oriented. First thing, like when when we like Nepalese come to America, is like we always complain. Ah, oh, the family. Once they're old, most of them are in old houses, old home, old people home, and that kind of hits us a little bit more. It was like we don't try to do. There are old people houses, but there's they have their own sad stories and we associate like living in old old people house is like really really sad which is for a lot of people for a lot in at least in america it might not be it might be really good for them i, I don't know like that culture itself but uh, we associate uh, in american like and as you said as well uh there's a little bit of family culture more more you see more family ties in, in uh asian countries in nepal as well where 
uh, it feels like they have a more connection. And there's good and bad of it as well. I, I have to come into set up mine is just like it's different. <laughs> I don't I would, I would say it's like it's not good or bad. It's just different. And due to, due to the situation, due to the culture growing up, maybe that's how it came out to be. And the business practices, of course, America has a, uh, once you are rich enough, you uh, kind of uh, get rid of the bad things. Right. And Nepal is poor. So it's not uh, you have to work around the bad things. So it's there. And your perspective wise, what uh, what kind of hit you more? Yeah, if, if one is if it's like this, yeah. you know, then there's some other part of this world that's like this and some other part of this world that's like this. And yeah. They equal in the end, in my mind. And mm -hmm. I think this movie, the hardest part was having to walk into this issue because it's so against this part of me, mm -hmm. right? Expl like revealing an issue is so against revealing an issue in another country as a white man in a different country. You know, there's this big thing of imperialism and it's a very big thing in history. And it was just like, oh no, like this. And yeah. One, one thing is like, uh, uh, you put yourself as a privileged American, even in the, uh, the title of it in the documentary yeah and we oh, like in nepal we almost have like no no care for like okay what is privilege anybody rich is privileged <laughs> so we don't care if you are like a white black or anything you are rich you're privileged right that's uh, that's basically how it goes but uh i di i did not take it as in that sense but i just wanted uh, to know like your experience but uh, for americans uh the sense of privilege kind of comes around, but I would, I would almost say it's like, it doesn't matter if you come from privilege or not, you might be poor, but still unaware of things happening around the world. And your documentary shows that uh, your experience of those 12 days and uh, getting even getting to know the language and your culture, you, it shows your effort, but you are put in a, how do you say, let's use a, a term from unaware to putting place in the right in the situation where everything is happening around you and you have to grasp it and be aware and be sensitized at, around the situation. You see poor people, you see the struggle, you see how, you see, you literally saw how much they get paid and how much you have to manage yeah. the balance, right? And that, uh, how did that, how did that hit you? Like, yeah, uh, I, think, I think my goal, the problem was ha realize seeing all that uh -huh. and then my goal is how do you shed light on this mm. how do you shed light on this without people thinking nepali people mm. are in need but rather thinking people are in a bad situation mm -hmm. do you know there's a slight difference mm. it's not like nepali people are poor or nepali people don't have money or they're developing it's more like hey these are any people in the world mm -hmm. and they're in a problem state mm -hmm. and you can make this movie in america with or you know you can make this movie anywhere and yeah. because i didn't want to walk into this so okay now that i have it's like how do i align it with my views which are which are this is just an issue of the world mm -hmm. don't look at it like like this so my whole goal was to try and to humanize humanize everyone in the film and show that you know it's the same you know that that's probably my biggest regret of the film is that there's not a regret but people have good and bad sides everywhere in the world and the mm -hmm. film is very good and you know mm -hmm. you don't want to show bad but everyone has good and bad and, and i just want to be like hey mm -hmm. the it's not that they're so nice they're just people with good bad love hate everything and they're in a problem so mm -hmm. They, so, they're not living the full human life that yeah. every human deserves. So during your journey of 12 days, you basically started, uh, you, left, uh, you lived with them, you got pay, paid as the, uh, they would have. And how was the uh, journey itself for you? Not, uh, not, the, not just uh, regarding exactly. the experience with people, but the uh, work, how hard was the work? Yeah, the, the work, you know, the work is really necessary to the industry. Mm -hmm. The job of a porter is there are no roads there. 
So, and the animals, there are not that many animals. There are a lot, but they get tired and they cost extra money. So humans are necessary to carry equipment and the job is very necessary. And uh, the job is, the job is hard, but a lot of jobs are hard, Mm -hmm. right? So it's hard to, a lot of jobs are hard. Mm -hmm. This one is physically hard. So you have to carry heavy weight long distances, but some days are only three hours. Mm -hmm. Some days are seven hours. And once you get accustomed, once I got accustomed, it was much easier to carry the weight. So that's, that's okay. It's a hard job. Jobs are hard. But what's unfair is that you're not making a proper salary, right? So mm. I'm not going to say the job, I say the job is the hardest in the world a little bit just to get people to watch. <laughs> but uh, it's what's hard is not making a proper salary, is not being able to escape this job if you wanted to, right? Mm. You can work at Formula One and work 25 hours, 20 hours a day, and this can be a hard job. But hopefully you're making the money that is in response to that. Hopefully you're not sleeping on the ground. Mm. Hopefully you're getting to eat a full meal instead of having to get one or two helpings of rice at the highest altitude because there's not enough food. What right? is so the, you, when, you, when you talk with the other people or the fellow porters, what was their uh, main concern or what, what was their main uh, things that they kept on the issue? Is what they, money. 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 Money is, money is talked about a lot and it's, it's because mm-hmm. Because you're not, I mean, you're at Kalapatar, which is the highest place before Everest, you're spending more than you're making. We, yeah, that's, we spend, that sounded insane for me. It's just like, wh- why, why is it managed that way? We spent $20 and we made 15 that day. So that's just absurd. How am I supposed to, and you know, there's a hierarchy to every structure. So you go Porter, God, Everest Porter, and Everest Porter is where you make the big money, mm-hmm. which still isn't even just money, but... Um, how do you get to Everest? You have to have $3,000 to buy the equipment for Everest. You know, the boots cost $600. Mm-hmm. How, how would you save that? Maybe if you're a guide and you get lucky with tips, but to become a guide, this is this whole article I'm planning to write to share all of this mm-hmm. because I think this is what needs to be shared. Um, how do you become a guide? You have to learn languages. How do you learn languages? You need time. You need money. You know, or for time, you need money. And how do you get time if you're a porter? You literally can't because you're spending money as you're working. So I, it's just about raising the sal. It's about a lot of things. It's yeah. not just raising. It's not the government's fault. It's not anyone. But the goal is just to make it so that, hey, this job is still a job. It's still on the lowest rung of this hierarchy. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to pay porters $10 million mm-hmm. to do this. They're still like starting out. You know, they're the first year of this career that's it's the first level but how do you make that first level you know sustainable like yeah i think uh with the whatever is happening right now the the whole tourism industry is kind of really handicapped or i think a lot of it almost is destroyed Uh, yeah i've heard i've been hearing things like okay uh, a lot of the places where the tourists are since nobody's coming nowadays the a lot of the having the tourism in the be- same sector again would be really insane to start again so there's going to be yeah. a lot of changes hopefully for better but yeah. uh, just think about like now just think about those people who are with you they don't have a job uh, and that no. sucks too i think about that and then i and then i think I just keep doing keep doing my job i can't control that i can yeah. keep my job i can keep I can keep getting this last, everything we're talking about now, you know, why people aren't tipping, why all the issue part of it mm-hmm. is that's like the last step, I think, for me to get out. Yeah. Because in the CNN article, there's, it's mainly about me. You yeah. Know? <laughs> yeah. Mostly. Which, yeah. Yeah. Most of the things that you talked about in uh, the documentary, as well as now, just like listening to you, I almost feels like... But I want our audience and everybody to know the the trans I guess the transformative feel when you are when you have no knowledge about a culture a lifestyle 
and you are placed in that situation and the knowledge you come up with can be really transformative for a lot of people. And uh, beside that, like once you came out of the job, like uh, the, your journey, mm -hmm. and uh, did you leave in Nepal right away or what happened? Yeah, so we talked about earlier how I was doing the, jo the film mm -hmm. and the job. So yeah. it was like two, I'm not saying two jobs, but it was a lot of stress. Um, because of that, obviously it's not, my experience is not gonna set in for months, you know? Mm -hmm. So I went, two weeks after this, I flew straight to Hollywood because I still wanted to become famous and I thought that was what I was supposed to do. <laughs> so I was living on my friend's couch. I still had no money. I uh, I'd spent it all on this thing. I was biking around on a bike with no brakes and I was still smelly. I was in a sweaty t-shirt or, or a, a hoodie I was wearing, eating 7-Eleven. If you've ever been to 7-Eleven, I was eating 7-Eleven yeah. hot dogs to survive, <laughs> which is lower than street food. Um, I, they're very good, no offense. Those are, those are survival food. I've, I'm dependent on those as well. <laughs> they're very good, but you don't want to eat them to survive. Oh, man. And, uh, <laughs> I, I was going to very big meetings, very, very big meetings and tall skyscrapers with big companies. And, mm. and for some reason I was having all the success but my mind was starting to fall apart and I didn't know why. And so uh, I went home and I went home for a couple of reasons. My, the editing system was there, but I also went home because I was really screwed up <laughs> and I didn't know why. And then as I worked through the film, mm. You know, I still thought Hollywood would come and make this film for me. <laughs> and I, I just made, because I didn't know how to make a film. So I was like, I'll make a trailer and then they'll pick that up and pay me and they'll, they'll do this all for me. And they didn't. And then I was yeah, like, oh, Hollywood right. works differently. <laughs> yeah, I'll do a little more. I'll do a little more. I'll do a little more. And then I eventually, months and months later, we got to this point. But the, more, the further I got, the better my mind got, because it was really, really bad. Because I didn't, I couldn't process what had happened. Like it was too much input. I don't know what it was. It was just so different. I just, I was just very blind. I was very, very blind before all of this. And yeah, did you ever uh, plan to release the documentary as a, okay, we did the documentary and release it because uh, I know uh, the CNN article covered it and you tried to reach out to others as well. But I think the message is pretty important that uh, if if it could be brought up more, it should be. And uh, this, I, I don't know if even if you realize it or not, but the the message up there, or maybe you went with uh, anybody can do, uh, anybody can experience this, and you went with us. I guess you went with a storytelling way of one way, but the, the way I perceived it came out to be even more vaster than you think. <laughs> the way yeah. I perceived it was, okay, there's an experience. There's an experience. He experienced it. And a lot of people who, you know, you, a lot of people, it's almost like uh, going to rehab. You, you need a transformative change. And uh, f you went your path. You, you seeked out adventure and you came a little bit more enlightened than when you ca went in. Because for me, uh, when I came to United States, right? And I, I would say I, I would not consider myself a, like a rich, but uh, well, uh, pretty okay livelihood back home in Kathmandu. So I, I never faced like, uh, I never had problem with uh, money or so on for growing up as a child. But mm -hmm. when I came to United States, it's expensive. So that's when it's like my my face, uh, how do you say, my growing up started in American lifestyle. So mm. I know the trouble and the pain from here and it transformed me. And for you to experience that, maybe even, uh, that's not a lot of time, but even a little bit and help you transform. And maybe when the audience sees those uh, the documentary and maybe they realize something is like, all of the culture, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of happiness. Uh, the lifestyle is different. You got to experience it. You can't just stay in one, say, uh, say one bubble and just say, this is it. You got to experience all of those. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think this is the, you know, there's a lot going on in the world that's bad, but with internet, with everything that's going on, we're mixing more and more and more mm. and more and more. And we're only going to mix more and more and more. <laughs> and there's going to be a lot of pain in that. There's going to be a lot of growing pains. There's going to be a lot of things that people don't understand. 
hurt because it's different. You don't know what's what. You don't know who's you. You don't know what's right. And it's also amazing because, mm-hmm. you know, this is this is the future. If you, if you can get to mix and intermingle and understand different realms, then you get to the place mm-hmm. of knowing more and then knowing that you don't know more and then knowing that you just don't know a lot. And uh, there's a ton of more for me to learn, but mm-hmm. I think that's the beauty. I think I've always gotten along better with foreigners. I don't know why, but mm-hmm. I just think uh, – yeah, I think it's amazing. I think there's, I get really passionate about the idea to like, like the intermingling of everyone should be together and just of every country and place and. Oh, that's cool, man. That that's definitely a a, a thing that should be happening more often. And it, what, happening, yeah, you know? what's what's your next on your journey now? Like, I, as you said, you started pretty much. I uh, wanted to start your adventure all the way running with the bulls. Mm-hmm. And you went try. Oh wait, you did go trek. Uh, you did climb some. Uh, I saw I some photos of you trekking, right, in the mountain. Yeah, I climbed Island Peak as a project. Okay. Um, I done a, I done a fair amount of things, but I mean, not that much compared to some. But um, I don't know. Next, I don't know. There's literally so much you can do. Like, honestly, honestly, I don't like to say what I'm gonna do mm-hmm. because. I just want it to happen. I don't know. I just want to go and, and do what I do and it's going to happen. And if I'm going to paint a picture of me doing this or that, or it's just talking about, I don't, I don't know. I'm going to know that I'm going to continue to work and try to produce something that's hopefully reaches even a bigger audience than this. Mm-hmm. And that's more that, that takes another step in some direction. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to be a book. If that's going to be another <laughs> film. If that's going to be becoming a mathematician or like, I'm just going to freaking ride the wave and wherever this wave goes, I'm going to try and continue to work on the principles of like, of being a human, which have, I, yeah, I, would, I would suggest to you to uh, really think about going into documentary because I was impressed with your, this frost project of yours. And I think you have a big career in this side and man, I don't know how, how long it has been, but yeah, it's really honored talking to you, man. Like uh, all of the experiences you said was really, t- uh, it gave me a feel of like uh, a transformative feel that you might have felt, but it uh, reminded me of myself as well. And there's a lot of stories there. There's a lot of pain there and uh, it's good to b- bring it out in light. Maybe there can be some transformative uh, for the people. And uh, yeah, thanks. I would, I would really want other people to watch this documentary as well. So, uh, yeah, l- l- just tell me, like, oh, where, t- where can I find the documentary for the people? Yeah, for the people. For the everybody, public, free public. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's on Vimeo. It's mm-hmm. at theporterfilm.com. It's on YouTube. I think I actually have to change that um, that version. to I spelled someone's name wrong. Mm-hmm. Then I have to, I want to get it. My goal is, like, to get it everywhere. Okay. My goal is to get it everywhere. If Netflix call, I'll get it there. If Amazon call, I want to get it there. If, why can't you just put it everywhere? That's yeah, like, definitely. So the, the documentary is called The Potter, Untold Story of Everest. Well, this guy uh, gets a uh, time of his life. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Nate. It yeah, thanks awesome. for having me. Thanks for having me, Abbas. It was, it was a treat, dude. Thank you.